Blog Talk Radio. Good morning, everybody. Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are on the planet. Hello to people in the chat. Hello to people on the podcast. It's the Galactic History Show, uh, the first show of the week. There will be this show and another show in two days' time on this same channel. And we hope you can all, all can make it. And uh, joining me today is a Galactic Historian, Andrew Bartzis. Hello, Andrew. How are you? Hello, Chris, everybody, live from Hanalei Bay, Hawaii, Hawaii, and welcome to the next episode of the Galactic Historian Show with the original evolution philosopher, Chris Hales. <laughs> the original, I, my, Andrew, I think I may have discovered a couple more. We'll talk about that later. I think so. I, I think you have lit the Venusian philosopher beacon of hope. <laughs> yeah, they're all lighting it back. Well, I've run, run across two gentlemen uh, that I'll 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 get your uh, opinion on these guys um, at some point in the next few days, and uh, we'll see where that goes. And I was oh, I had, didn't have time to contact Lance before the show, but I was uh, we must get him back on because he's the other functionary in that in that aspect at this point in time. But it's good to hear you, Andrew. And how is Hawaii going? Are you having a break, or is it uh, sole family sole family business? It has been an incredible break. We arrived here Sunday afternoon, got into the Hanalei Bay Beach Resort, and uh, went swimming. Uh, went down to the beach, greeted the the water and the turtles and the ocean people, and then when proceeded, had a really interesting lunch at a low breakfast that included their their local. Uh, uh, what is that stuff called? Uh, stuff that tastes like wallpaper paste until they flavor it. So. Hello. Oh, second. Someone calling in. Uh, someone calling in on the other phone here. Can you hear me now? Yes, you're good. Okay. Okay. So you were taking breakfast on the ocean, by the sound of it, or near the ocean. Uh. Afternoon lunch on the breakfast on the beach, and then we were up till one or two o'clock in the morning just. Talking, having a good old time, and uh, Chris, you've got um, you've got Nikki with you there, and Helene. Yes, Nikki and Patsy and Helene uh, Lipson are here also, as well as Katie and Larry, Katie and Larry the 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 main comrade com- comrades in the traveling fair, band of merry fairies. So, so you've left the left the guards in place at the castle, and sallied forth. Sallied forth as we go on with our coconuts going clippity clop. Yeah, clippity yes. clop. That's it. Yeah, that's pretty much the vision that I had. <laughs> so Larry's got his coconuts. Yes, Larry's got his full coconuts. Excellent stuff. Well, we're here again on the show, and we've got the audience uh, uh, in the chat room. And I put a note in the chat room, which whizzed past, and probably the people who've joined us in the last few minutes may not have seen it. We are going to take calls at the start of the, at the start of the show, or in a few minutes' time. So if you're actually on the phone and you have a question, uh, put up your hand. And uh, if you're in the chat room, post the question. I'll try and keep track of them. It does. In fact, I may actually um, I'll launch the bigger version of the chat room so I can follow it in case people actually have questions in the chat. The small chat room is quite difficult to follow because it's actually a very small window and they disappear almost immediately. So questions can be hard to find. But um, we have a lot of topics kind of hanging. Uh, second half of the 20th century is one. Uh, another is the things that are holding us back. There's the user manual for the human body, which we'll be doing with Nikki on Thursday. Uh, having another show and and uh, winding up the uh, discussion on human sexuality and moving on to some more stuff, uh, which will be a, that'll be a very interesting show because we're heading into a few key health issues around sexuality, which really do need to be explored. And of course, there's uh, issues as to what's going on. Um, we're talking to the galactic historian here, so there are no limitations on what we, what we can explore. And uh, so today we're going to start with questions. In fact, we've got someone with our hand up now, right now. Would you like to take a question to begin with, Andrew, rather than launching into anything else at this point? I just, just want to remind everybody, today I'm doing a, uh, a live teleseminar with Heal Scott. You can find all the information out at SovereignMedia.net or my Facebook page. And I believe it's 7 p.m. Eastern time. 
that it starts, uh, and I'm six hours behind, so I have to make sure all, all my time's trying to balance everything on all the different time zones I function. But if you go to SovereignMedia.net, um, for those that uh, originally last week, Teal and I were supposed to do a live show, but she became ill, and so we rescheduled it for today. And for those of you that already paid, you'll be, a get, you'll be able to get a code to go. And for those that want to come in and listen, um, for brand new, please stop on sober, by SovereignMedia.net. And there's a little um, graduated pay scale there for those that don't have any, you know, very little money but still want it here. And for those that want to make a bigger donation. And this will be going for helping the Return to Atlanta event for all the different speakers that are presenting their, for their plane tickets to arrive there. And then there'll be a series of other teleseminars that you'll be able to uh, get information for that are being done by SovereignMedia.net. While we're on the subject of um, future events, Andrew, I've actually, I, I haven't actually uh, told you this yet. I've actually started up one more radio show on my little um, One People's Oneness Radio channel. And I just wanted to put out the word about that as well. That's actually happening in the U.S. Michelle, um, happening in the U.S. on Wednesdays, one three p.m. time, same time as as this show. But it's happening on a little channel called the One People's the One People Oneness Radio, and it's called the Long Conversation. It's really a thing I've been wanting to do for a while, which is going to be me having the sorts of conversations that I think we need to have in general terms, you know, pursuing, pursuing specific things. And uh, it's a two-hour show, and it'll be in 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, in Australia, it'll be at the, the ungodly hours of, of 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. as per usual. But um, first hour for at least the first few weeks is going to be with Julian Wells, actually, Andrew. Uh, as you know, Julian and I have been doing sort of weekly, sometimes bi-weekly updates for many months now, and we kind of uh, stepped out of that routine a little bit because things were shifting about for everybody for quite a you know, for about a month or five weeks there. It's settled down now, and we want to get back to the updates because people really enjoy it. And we have these really interesting conversations about things that Julian's up to and has got views on. So we're going to be doing an update for the first hour with Julian for for a few weeks. It's going to be the place where we do those instead of on the you know, it'll be at his lunchtime instead of to and from work. <laughs> We always do these at very odd times for him. But it will be um, a great supplement to the work that you are doing in the webinars. And uh, it leads to all sorts of other interesting conversations. But the other, the other part of this is that I really want to talk about uh, something we talked about <clears throat> on that webinar last week with, um, with Blake and, uh, and the other members of the crew a brainstorming session where we were really talking, ended up talking about new governance, about the system that will follow this one. That's the main conversation that um, that I want to actually get going. But of course, there'll be lots of conversations because you know it'll be a matter of of pulling people on for that second hour, um, and there are many and varied people out there that we can involve in these conversations, including the callers. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be fun. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to that too. It's nice to see Julian uh, doing his updates and uh, able to do it at a time that's you know not going to be in and out of work for him. I know life is kind of getting getting busy for him there. It is, it is, and we're sort of cramming things into the the, the few corners that are still empty, and that applies to all of us. I don't really know anybody that isn't in that mode at the moment. Uh, the whole the whole system that we're in is under a lot of stress, and that's reflecting in, in you know the pressure on people day to day something that we hope will ultimately be completely changed. But that's another story, another conversation. What we, we have today is galactic history. So we have two people with pins up now that we've done the, uh, the notices about Let's the shows. The call. Let's do it. Okay, so area code uh, 85. Could we have your name and your question, please? Area code 785. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, uh, this is Carlos from Kansas. Um, this question is for Andrew. Andrew, um, about five years ago, I started researching uh, propaganda and um, subliminal messages in magazines and 
commercials and everything, so I decided to see for myself. I picked up the magazine at the grocery store, and I started looking for all the, you know, whatever. And um, I looked really, really, really closely at the picture, beyond, like beyond the pixels or something like that, and I could see faces, uh, demonic faces or maybe reptilian faces or something that are embedded in the... Um, um, in the picture, and I'm wondering, uh, there's two questions to it. Why are they embedded in there? And two, why can I see them and no one else does or something? Thank you. You said this was five years ago? That was about five years ago, yeah. Are you still able to see them now? I haven't looked in the, for a while, so I don't know if they're still the there. The why is, do you remember... Do you remember the big thing they wanted to switch everybody to digital TV and they made it a big thing worldwide and they were giving people free free updates and all that? I do, yes. It's because the technology was the technology was changing so fast as well as the perceptions of people were were able to literally see the propaganda and the technology had to be one, two or three steps ahead of the changing DNA and the changing awakening of human consciousness. For propaganda in television to be effective, it has to be just barely a step ahead of consciousness, because if it's too far ahead, what will happen is you won't perceive it. So it's multidimensionally. It's not just there to affect you on your visual eyesight. It's meant to affect you on a subconscious level, on a spiritual level, and then on a pre-programmed reality level. Because there are things, example, you ever at a clock and it's 11 11 two times in a day yeah you ever stopped at the same stoplight going to work for every week one stoplight always gets you um i don't remember i don't live in the city anymore so <laughs> well I, the I, whole I don't concept that. is that reality has the whole thing is reality has a program to it and the television airwaves and propaganda airwaves are a way of keeping you in sync with the reality program because the reality has to be updated frequently because there are people that are able to get beyond reality and do things such as what I do or what Chris does or what any of the other conscious explorers that want freedom want. Does that answer your question? Um, sure, yeah. It's okay. The technology is specific. It's a theory, it's a theory broadcasting technology right, in, in satellites right, yeah. that were created in six in six hundred AD that were launched via psychic, um, a psychic method where multiple psychics projected all of their power into an object. The object was made out of granite and marble. The inside was the one layer was outlined layer was marble. The inside was liquid, um, liquid quicksilver with uh, multiple magnets on the various poles. So the psychics would concentrate on the magnets. The the liquid quicksilver would begin to spin and create a ro pole, rotate pole. And then a number of mm, high energy people were sacrificed, and then their consciousness energy was put inside the liquid quicksilver, and then the vehicle was then launched via psychic propulsion and put into space, and its purpose was to be a scanning, domination, and control tool over local warlord areas so that they can continue the rolling mass of warlords to take over the local reality one by one by one. And that, what year was that, Andrew? 600 AD was the first one was launched. How many have been launched in total? Thousands. And they're still they're all up? set up all through. They're, yeah, they're all throughout set up through the different layers of reality and in the timelines on purpose. So if one is removed, several more can be brought in out of phase of time, out of phase of reality. Um, as I said many times, Earth is a massive fortress, and you must out out endure the fortress. So the, these, how many satellites are actually in play at any point in time? In Earth orbit, currently about 38,000. Wow. And if any are knocked out, they can actually be replaced immediately by pulling them out of it. Instantaneously. Like as soon as one is removed, think of a the classic idea of a dead man switch 
if one if one is removed, the other one instantly reappears. If that one is removed, ten more appear. If, if those ten are removed, a thousand more appear. Okay. Are they are they um, how many of them are in our physical as opposed to being dimensionally shifted? I mean, are they observable? Um, well, could you ob yeah. could you actually observe them in in uh, with with technology? Okay. They're always out of phase of reality, just above or below our visual spectrum, because what they do is broadcast into our visual, auditory, or psychic perceptions. That's their purpose. How could they be? Moved? Think of them like ghosts. Think of them like ghosts. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can I can see how that how that works, and that would actually. All pervasive. When, when, when you sacrifice twenty five thousand people, you know, to create an object of domination and control, and all of their spiritual essence of their physical DNA body is put into these objects, with the donation and control spirit launching it into space, you know, you have a very powerful destructive tool as well as tool of domination and control that can operate on very subtle levels, and it has more than enough energy to last for a very long period of time. The consciousness that's inside these, that I gather that, that, that people were sacrificed and their consciousness was actually moved into these objects? Is that correct, your patient? Correct. How many people there would per be satellite? Equivalent of what would be, there would be an equivalent of a management archon, one archon inside the satellite. The satellites are linked to the archon, archonic control network. How can, we just, well, how can they be removed? What well, that's the thing. What would it take to get rid of them? It would take an active group of individuals, an active group of uncooperative cooperatives that understand that this technology has to just be eliminated from our timeline. B, an active group of remote influencers that connect to the, con the consciousnesses that were sacrificed inside them and figure out a way to get them their sovereignty back so they're able to leave the, con the container. Um, three, you could actively hit the Archon network at their, pri at their primary points so that the Archon network, see the secondary part of the etheric satellite is that the Ar Archonic network is ever taken out, there would be an instantaneous backup system that could take over the incarnation grid, which would be the etheric satellite grid. You, have, you could create a separate, you could find a way to sever the link between the two grids, and then the, uh, the other grid would go active, and then the two would start fighting each other. This could be done by remote influences? It would have to be done by a pretty significant size group of people, of light workers that have cleared their physical bodies. Because if they try to work with an Archon network like that without a cleared physical body, with any of their, their, their spirit traumas left over, they're putting their, their hand into the fire, fire and are going to get burnt. Mm. So it has to be well-prepared people that have dealt with this type of energy before. And then to have people to protect them afterwards so that there isn't a, a, a response because the, the Archon network has a system beyond it. And that system can be say, hey, these guys are attacking me. Find a, re a reactionary response and go after them. And some non-physical entities may come after you if you're not protected in your projection. So it has to be done smart. It has to be done with a, a team. Mm. If if and the they system don't make it easy. no, they don't. That's an extraordinarily uh, complete piece of technology and a very old one by the sound of it. At what point was that grid that that satellite system complete? If it started in 600 AD, when did they you know get it all into place? Thirty-one million years ago. Well, it's just timeline wars, remember? Oh, okay, yes. They created stuff leapfrogging through time because they all they needed to have was a beachhead on one time zone, and then they could invade all of the other time zones simultaneously and allow them to feather out until they'd actually determined what actual time zones they took over. And once they took over a series of time zones, they made a series of other beachheads into, into other areas they haven't conquered. And the etheric satellite system is what keeps the rolling band of destruction go, going because they can bring them out of other time zones and create the beachhead effect any other place that they needed to create. There's no technological solution for this. You can't 
You can't go after this um, with ships, for instance? It doesn't have moving parts. You know, so, the only moving part is mercury, mm. quicksilver, mm-hmm. and some magnets on the inside to keep it spinning. And then, you know, the input of, 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 of thousands of dominated control consciousness that are totally removed from their DNA bodies. And then those DNA bodies that they're removed from were put into the system of domination and control. You know, not as zombies, but as, as, as parts of a trading network of DNA. So those souls were severed from their body, severed from their karmic interaction. Um, there's always a way to deal with it on a, on a karmic level, but you'd have to identify the individual archon uh, group that's doing that specific thing. Hmm. Incredibly complex situation. Uh, do we have the people on the planet that could do this? Yeah, they're here. They're just not organized. And that's the other part of the system is to separate everyone via soul family so no one's together via soul family. This would be you know, best that, be that done. Makes it more hard. Yeah. This would best be done by a soul family group, uh, you know, with the right capabilities because that would have the, the yeah. as a group they would have far more power if you like to actually carry this task out. These soul family groups do exist here in our world just they're parts of the system of domination and control. Those were the first things that they went after. Go after the warrior groups. Yeah. And all you got a bunch is left the peacenik, hippie, loving tree lovers, plus the alchemist and the other hermit type people that don't want to invest their karma in changing the world because they're still under the belief of non-interference, which is a, a load of crock of shit to me at this point in time. Stand up for your world or get off of it. Mm-hmm. That's what it's coming down to. Everyone out there, including the non-physical entities that are listening, this is the time. This is the where the rubber hits the road. Make a choice. Stand up and declare your sovereign free will or get off the goddamn planet. You know, I had a conversation. Trying... Sorry, please go ahead. Uh... I've, been, I've been trying to form a group here. I live in the middle of, like, quote, nowhere, and I met some people. And I've been trying to get a, form a group but it just seems like uh, they're too busy. And they live in a small town, you know, and it's like, uh, so I'm still hoping that we might form a group or something, but um, right now I'm still holding my breath. And I, and I mention people's names, I especially mention you, you know, go to these guys' websites and listen to this radio station, or and uh, I don't, don't know if they do it or not, but, um, you know, I've been trying to do this for a long time, just planting seeds but now it's time to like you said you know it's time to do it now it's, it's time to step up time to step up exactly. so that's, why both, that's why both Chris and I have been on a lightning of doing as much radio as we could possibly do I'm going to be blunt come Christmas it's going to get crazy but there are people that are not going to perceive the craziness because they are so far into the program all they will see is Fox News Rolling Stone magazine, Facebook, and the rising price of gas and, and chocolate chips. All right? That's all they're going to do is that all they allow the reality to show them. For those that are on the cutting edge that reality is changing, those are the ones that, that we need to, to step forward and declare their sovereign free will. Not because I said it, because it's right for those own souls. Chris, you're doing, what, 20-plus hours of radio a week now? Ah, some weeks uh, it hits that, yes. Uh, it varies depending yeah, on I'm, I'm, webinars and other things that go on, but, uh, yep. I'm, I'm, I'm right at the same way, and I used to be doing even more. I actually did a 13-and-a-half-hour radio show about six months ago. Hmm. All right? 13-and-a-half hours. And in that time, I had over 400,000 people come and listen to that show. And I'm not floating my own boat or, or saying anything other than there are people out there that come and listen to shows, shows that help them through the transition. The transition from what? From being semi-conscious to being conscious to being, oh, my God, what the hell is happening to our world? What can we do to change it? All right, it changes here, but how do we help others awake? Those are the stages that people are in right now. And those stages, we as people that are presenters have to keep our backs to minds that there is material that some people just cannot perceive. They're literally, the ears and the brain cannot hear it 
because the reality won't allow them because they're so invested into their belief systems. I have uh, all all the time. Uh, sorry, jump in. Uh, I, I'm sure you're aware of the documentary called The Serious Disclosure, and I've mm -hmm. been thinking about yeah. um, showing that at our local theater, and I've already got the price um, down, and uh, I'll be using my own money for it. But... Um, I have some trepidations. Like, is it is it good? Is it a good documentary to show to people? It's kind of like history 101. You know, you just your first steps in, or or um, should I wait and show another video that might be a little bit different? Or you have any? Uh, I'll be absolutely. I'll, I'll be absolutely honest with you. I love Dr. Stephen Greer. I really do. But this material was nothing we haven't seen before. And the same exactly. thing with the citizen disclosure hearings was nothing we haven't heard before. There was no groundbreaking news. Mm. All right. Um, the, the movie itself got delayed and delayed. There were people that were murdered. Right. Don't get me don't get me wrong. I love Dr. Stephen Gray and he's in a very serious position. That the precipice of decisions that will affect his soul for a very long period of time. So there were people that were murdered that were very close friends of his. So there's material that hasn't been released on purpose, uh, and that's his, that's his material that keeps his life alive. Yeah. Okay? Right. So if you want to play, do it, because you are going to add to the, to the mystery, mystery, mystery and genre. You know, as for doing your own money, maybe you can get a regular broadcast date at your local library on a, on a projection TV in a big movie theater. Or maybe you can indicate and, and advertise it so people pay ahead so you don't have to lose your own money. Be smart about it. Right. I, 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 the, the, the documentary just fell short because he needed to save his own life. Simple right. as that. Okay. If he would have played that, I didn't know. He would, have, he would have never been out. He would have ended up in a car accident that sounded like he had a heart attack from eating too much McDonald's cheeseburgers. Yeah. Carlos, the decision about what information to put in front of people, if, if you're just dealing with the general public who are you know, not taking any notice of, the, of this material at all, the decision about what to put in front of, in front of people is a difficult one. You know, there are things in each community which will attract more attention than others. You might find something like the Thrive documentary, for instance, which yeah, is quite I a good... It's, it's, quite, it's quite a good sort of... Um, overall picture it's it's not particularly scary you know if you start going over to the work of David Icke for instance you know it gets a bit scarier it's hard to know which bits of information to actually use my recommendation would be go lightly start with right. start not too not too threatening and scary otherwise they'll just shut down they won't they'll walk away from it it's it's too much for them to take in and also if it's too esoteric for instance if you were to show them the work of so Michael Tassarian, for instance, um, that's probably getting a touch too esoteric for an introductory audience because you're dealing with the general public and you've got to put things, you've got to get some anchor in their reality right. to, to work from. And the UFO one actually is a good one because everyone's heard of UFOs. In fact, I picked up a book that belonged to my grandfather, which is done in the 1950s the other day. And it was one of these kind of general science books they used to put out of back then, you know, sort of these, you know, what about the, you know, and that they deal with various things. Well, the second item inside this book, in fact, may even be the first, is what are UFOs, which I found absolutely fascinating. And guess what? UFOs are apparently are misidentified weather balloons, swamp gas, cloud formations, yada, yada, yada. Now, what I'm looking at was a piece of propaganda that actually came out of the Roswell incident. They were trying to shore up that particular piece of publicity. And, you know, this book is sitting in my library. So although it's been denied all these years, it's in people's minds. They know about UFOs because they occasionally hit the news here and there. So there's an anchor for it, which is which is good. Um, the other the other stuff, the geopolitical stuff, tends to make people a bit tense. The UFO one is actually quite a good one. And st as as Andrew said, there was nothing in that documentary that I hadn't seen before. And that's fine, but the people you're dealing with haven't seen any of that stuff in that documentary before, so it'll still have an impact. But as right. to, you know, the the way that I always 
if I'm dealing with someone who's coming at us with closed eyes, the important thing that you do is give them enough information that they want to actually ask questions and go and look at stuff. So it's actually easy to go too far and kind of overwhelm them and shut them down. You've just got to put out enough out there that they want to either ask you more questions or that they want to go away and do some research themselves. That's the key thing. The, doc the, right. the Dr. Seuss approach. Make it enlightening and just happy enough for them to go, I want to know more. Hmm. If they don't want any green eggs and ham, they won't come back. Yeah. And uh, if, I, if I'm having, because I have some fairly, fairly lengthy discussions with people at times, if you um, if you need to do, if if you find people interested and they want to go further and further, you have to be uh, very careful not to evoke a fear response. Okay. Right. So if you're talking to someone, and this is general advice to the listeners too. If you're actually talking to someone about the whole issue of you know, the, what what Andrew has very accurately termed the domination and control system, because that's exactly what it is. If you describe it as, you know, we've got a domination and control system, that's a bit threatening. And you can simply say, well, things aren't right with the world. And, you know, I've been doing some research and I'm starting to find that, that all governments are actually corporations. You know, well, did you know the governments were corporations? What do you think of that? You know, you can, you can ask them questions and right. test their knowledge and just make them think without necessarily saying, you know, all the governments are corporations. They built FEMA camps and they're coming for you. If you put it that way they'll shut you down. So it's a very right. a very uh, uh, light approach. It doesn't have to be comical. It, by light, I just mean not too threatening and intimidating because it's scary stuff. It is really scary stuff when you start to get down yeah. to it. And in fact, one of the best ways, and I was doing this just before the show, Andrew and I were, were talking about it, talking to some folks about how you describe the system to people who aren't really even looking for an explanation. And, and it goes something like this: the, the the actual planet is made up corporations. It's actually one corporation at its at its peak. All of the governments are corporations. All of the things that you view as public public entities are actually all corporations, and are co-owned by the same folk who actually own what we consider to be the public corporations. So big pharma military industrial complex, etc., etc. They're all the co-ownership and the links are all um, back to the same, essentially the same core group of people. And there's been a lot of good work um, done quite recently. In fact, I'll put, for those that are interested, I'll put a link on the chat that you can go and have a look at, which has got some great diagrams of co-ownership of companies. And if you put it to them, when they look around, the, look at the world around them. Don't look at it as you know a series of sovereign, supposed sovereign nations, you know, serving the the interests of the people, and trying to interact and and you know, um, trying to keep keep the world in a peaceful state and keep the financial system going. Just looking at it that way and start looking at it as one giant corporation, which is trying to conceal itself from you. But at the same time, it's trying to actually control everything about your life. That's what you're actually looking at. And when you do that and point out that the, uh, the United Nations, in fact, is, if you like, the, the, from a government, a, a purported government point of view, the United Nations is the point where the control system dumps instructions back into the political systems that purportedly exist. Um, to a few policies such that the the will of the owners of these corporations is done to us, you know, right at ground level. I'm talking it, this stuff drills back down to your local community by the Agenda 21 stuff. That all of these so-called nations slash corporations, on our behalf, have apparently agreed to. Okay, so the control mechanism is diffuse, hard to see. But as soon as you start looking at the corporations very hard, it's really obvious. So if you're trying, if people, you know, are saying what's wrong with the world, why doesn't it work? It's because it's a bunch of a bunch of corporations masquerading as governments that don't serve the people. They serve the corporations. That's why nothing ever improves. You're not serving right, with a bunch of people, with a, with exactly. a bunch of people who work in these government organizations and don't no clue they're a corporation. 
no, it's patriot none at programming. All. None at all. They think they're working for governments. We find this day after day after day. They don't know they're working for a corporation. And we've we've actually drilled via via um, folk like Scott Bartle, who's done a fantastic job. We've been we've been casting around in in government registration websites like the SEC website and the UCC registration. Uh, organizations on the internet and you know I'm finding that the, the, the country that, that I'm in Australia is actually a corporation whose headquarters is registered in the Australian Embassy in Washington DC and you get what why why does that exist well not only why does it exist who owns it now we know why it exists because it's the control mechanism well, they're the using. yeah exactly who owns it where, where are they now we, we right. had a very the the actual SEC website uh, for entities like the Commonwealth of Australia. And in fact, there's many different variations of the name registered corporations. They're playing all sorts of games with different different versions of of this so-called nation that we're living in here. When you look at the registration detail on these websites uh, with public companies, it tells it starts to tell you who the shareholders are. Etc. In the case of governments, it doesn't, but apparently it used to. And we ran across a lady who looked at these entries years ago, and apparently the Queen was down as the owner of Australia, which actually makes sense because she's the sovereign. But what that means is she owns it. So when we pay our taxes to this corporate entity, we were in Australia, we, we actually write taxation checks to the Commissioner of Taxation. Now, everyone assumes it's a person, but it's not. It's a corporation. It's a bank account. So we're actually yeah. writing out checks to a bank account as an individual, and it's not. It's a company. So where's the money going? Is it actually going to what we think is a government, or is it going straight out to this other account held who knows where, controlled by who knows, and then brought back into our, our financial system by the reserve bank that we have, which is part of the overall set of reserve banks that run the financial system. What I'm saying is that Corporate overlay has been in place for 80 years. They've been routing the money who knows where as soon as we pay it in tax form. We have no idea how much tax we've actually paid because we know they run multiple books. We could have earned, as our GDP might have been three times the size for the last 80 years, and we'd never know it because they're skimming from the top. Right, yeah. So that, and that'll, be, that'll be, probably be you know, the Queen who's skimming from the top. So the whole thing is a bait and switch. And it's happening. The same template in different versions applied to every nation on this planet that's running under this system. And there's only a handful left. And you know who they are because they're the ones that are being currently attacked. You know, Syria and, and Iran as examples. They're not in the system. They don't have uh, the reserve banking system operating in them. And they aren't part of the, uh, they aren't, uh, you know, closely attached to the United Nations like the rest of us are. That, that's the control mechanism. There's a lot more behind Syria, Iraq, and Iran, and that's the leftover technology that was part of the timeline genocide operations and storage facilities, because many of these timeline genocides were created out of the storage facilities so that if a timeline incursion was successful, there was a massive material base where new people could be timelined in and then rapidly take over the world. So the technology, I've called it before, the, the giant intergalactic antiques roadshow here and Syria, Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan and upper India is where all of the technology is stored a phase of reality in the physical grounds. So the fact that they don't have a reserve banking system is just shows the fact that the war for that area for that technology has gone, gone on for so long. There are also multiple other control rooms that exist in that area, but they can't physically get into them. So they don't really know where they're at until they've done an accurate deep scan with all the sensors and resonance over there, as well as the different womb chakras that are under that area. And if a womb chakra were to wake up, the rest of the population of the world would wake up. So there has to be a continuous war over that area. <laughs> See, this is why I like working with a galactic historian, because the, the, mm -hmm. the, the layers of the onion get peeled back multiply as soon as subjects like this come up. Because we observe the surface level and don't really know what's going on underneath. We're just, even though we're talking about a hidden corporation, it's still surface level, and there's yeah. layers and layers underneath it. It's and and see, 
because one of the hardest things for people to get is the layered aspect of this whole situation and the fact that if you want to drill down to who's actually running it you you, you very quickly arrive at the fact that there's you know 13 old bloodlines that are acting in in physicality as humans at the center of this control mechanism but beyond that there's another there's another couple of layers again you've got the archontic grid layer, and beyond that you've got the 15 multi-dimensional beings and you know the you know how do you explain that to someone who's just working a job nine to five right how do you exactly. get that concept across to them? very very difficult this is the conversation we're all having in the background is how do we explain this to the general public now Andrew's pulling this information back from the Akashic into the consciousness of the collective and you guys listening to it you know part of the reason that you're here now at this moment in time listening to it is that you are going to be explaining this stuff to other people at some point in the future yeah and you're being preloaded with the information that they will receive and and will be helping those around you to actually uh, put the information right out so that everyone's aware of exactly what's been going on as best we possibly can because it's going to take a long time for people to get their heads around all the details now the way that I generally explain it to oh. people is back again I'll I'm just back. finish what I was saying Andrew the way with the way that I've, I've, I've the methodology that I've arrived at for explaining to people what's going on in the simplest possible terms is first of all to describe the planetary structure and not as independent sovereign nations etc etc but as a single corporation that's hiding itself from view it's deceiving yep. us at every level uh, and primarily you know the, the most the one that's most invasive in our lives is the banking system and everything about it is deceptive the way they actually create money by by the act of lending for instance is, is a complete deception the way that they actually hypothecate the value that you actually give them when you sign is is completely deceptive and the other aspect of the system is the division that it it actually puts into the collective from the top of the collective to the bottom we're divided at at the top end into these nation states and all down physically to your house there's divisions you know it goes country uh, we'll say called so let's say nation and then there's a state inside the nation and then counties inside the state suburbs inside the county and it drills right down to your house and your family there's that all there's that division taking place where we're divided up into groups and then and then look at the world for a division and everywhere you find division you'll find the control system race religion sexuality financial status political parties sports you know you name it we're set at one another's throats and we have been for thousands and thousands of years because when we're actually aggressively competing with one another we are weaker as a collective far, far weaker and very controllable so wherever you see division you're looking at the system effects of the right. system we don't naturally divide ourselves off into religions that's been forced upon us we exactly. haven't had a human we haven't lived on the planet as real human beings for tens of thousands of years because of the division and deception and the information that's been removed from the collective and hidden from us and the way that we've been driven about in fear uh, we haven't had a chance to actually live as humans and the only time you ever see the real human characteristics appear is with this when there's some massive disaster that the government can't handle and everyone step up and helps the other right when you're looking at that you're looking at how human beings actually behave which gives me exactly. a great hope because that's still in us and they will never be able to take that away no matter what programming they do it'll still come out when when we have to step up and stepping up is what this whole process is all about you know cause when, when exactly. I first went down went down this path of, of getting involved in researching what was going on and starting to communicate with people who were doing the kind of work I'm doing now I kept getting the there's one message that I kept getting which is to be free the people must stand that's what we're talking about standing yeah. by standing I mean maybe a general strike uh, stop paying the banks and, the, and uh, simply reject the system that's that's the yeah. stand that we have to take because as soon as we withdraw our energy from the system it will it will just 
appear before our eyes, but we have to do it in in such great numbers that it, it has a cascade effect across the planet and has to be done in a way that's peaceful and preferably would, uh, joyous. Would not vo- would would not voting be one of those? Would that apply? Yes. How could okay, they have good, a couple if no one if if no one turned up? That's yeah. the thing. We, the, what they have to hear are the crickets. There's a better, honestly, there's a better way than not voting. It's rescind your voter registration on a mass scale. Yes. Right. Remember, they do voter yeah. registration drives every year for a reason. Need your tacit consent to continue the government in the background because tacit consent only allows them here in the United States to allow the 505 people, members of Congress, and Senate, and all different branches to function with laws that are already passed. If you begin to remove your voter registration and on a big scale, but your local governments, especially your local governments, say, I do not stand with the way of this method of operation of corporations, and you write a lengthy explanation letter of why you're resigning your, your, your right to, your, your, not, sorry, not your right to vote, your registration to vote, because that is where they get you in the consent part of the government. You know, that can okay. be just as much as a public pain. Mm. Andrew, we must talk about how to do it in this country because we have a, a different... We have actually compulsory voting in this country, which is tied to your birth certificate. The fact that you're actually registered in the system. Open? Sorry? When did they start compulsory voting? In the 60s? Can't tell you, actually. Not sure when it started. It was pre-60s. It was the original invention of the corporation. Mm-hmm. They knew ultimately that voting must be done so that the system of corporations would be accepted subvertly. If it's done in post sixties, the second generation of corporations where they needed to have voting compulsory because the type of ownership that they had on because you're, you're in Australia, you're defined a different version of cattle. Mm-hmm. Your, your your commerce, your your flesh and blood is commerce. Therefore, the commerce must have a voice, and the voice must be given to them through the system, which is a little different here in the United States where, you know, here you get your, you, once you get your, your birth certificate, you're considered dead and you tell them you're alive. And that's how they take advantage of you on that basic level. In your country, it's a little different the way they, they get you because your reality was different and they couldn't have a cookie cutter way. Mm-hmm. The way your reality in Australia was conquered was very specific, and therefore the system that was created had to be very specific for those local mm-hmm. realities to stay in domination and control and not to spawn independent realities of domination and control that could never talk to each other. Okay. In that case, we would have to um, literally rescind our, um, uh, no, our straw man entity to actually... Well, your citizenship, oddly. Mm-hmm. It comes down to where your citizenship comes from. Does your citizenship come from a province? Or does it come from a local magistrate? To my awareness, the citizenship actually comes from the birth certificate, from the, well, then, that relationship. I, I bet you it doesn't. I bet you that it's been it's been glossed over a few dozen times. Look, I wouldn't be surprised because the 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 the. the crap that they've pulled on the Australians in terms of um, saying one thing and doing another is incredible at, at that level. Well, what, do, that, what are you thinking it'll be? Think there are so many places of power one can reinvest their citizenship into Australia that has no government. That's why. Mm-hmm. So you could rescind your energetic citizenship and then re, re, re-put it to, to Ayers Rock or to dream some lands in Wilpena Pound or to the oceans that surround the great the great island of, of Australia, to the original uh, owner of uh, uh, dominion with the ancestors, and all of a sudden you no longer are part of the citizenary domination and control system that is the invading force that has conquered Australia as a dreamtime world. That's Australia is a continent. Is, let me finish. Australia is yep. a continent. It's a giant spaceship. It is meant to leave our world and literally land on other worlds to seed life in a brand new world and seed dream times in a brand new world. And then it's meant to take off and land back on Earth and then update the life force systems that are in there because Earth is a life force giving world. So, 
is actually a continent that could leave this planet. It's a unity, separate unity consciousness drive continent. Wow. It can merge with the continental structures of any other planet in any other environmental status to bring sentient life directly upload, like a USB drive would be plugged into a computer. Huh. Is that why they went after the <laughs> Aborigines? <laughs> well, uh, well, the Aborigines ha are, are an incredibly resilient people. They have held base here despite everything that's been done to them. And they've had... They've had They've literally been in in in, in the island of Tasmania. <clears throat> they were genocided. They were wiped out, <clears throat> which tells you what was probably down there. You know, it was a very deliberate act. But uh, in Australia itself, um, the the energetic space for their dream time has been held brilliantly by by the elders of, the group. and that's <clears throat> no doubt why is is the importance. Um, I mean, I, I've never heard what Andrew just said. I'm sitting here quietly gobsmacked again about that piece of information. I've been waiting to deal that one out for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, well, consider it built. There's going to be some, <laughs> going to be some uh, conversations when I finish the show. <laughs> People ringing me up saying, what? Really? Because I, uh, one of the conversations I had on the weekend was about um, uh, Stargate Atlantis, which is one of my favorite um, um, aspects of the, the Stargate series and the fact that this entire city could 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 actually fly intergalactically or you know between stars and I just love the idea of being able to have a whole city of people moving from planet planet across the cosmos and here you are telling me that the country I'm living in could do that well I want to know I want to know where the where the control panel is for that one <laughs> Um, I can't. I can't verbally say where the air cause a ra rather massive thing. Also, there are a number of other cities that can do the same thing. One in Kiev, one in Moscow, one in Washington D.C., one in um, Lipson, South Africa. There are other um, places that figured out how to create the technology on a city level, and these are called Unity Consciousness Drives, which I've spoken to you about a number of times. And Australia's unity consciousness continent drive system, where its purpose is to phase out of reality, turn into an energy-based vehicle with all the sentience held with inside its infinite energy system, and then to broadcast itself into the Dreamtime network of Earth, which is connected to our, our sun, which can then broadcast us to anywhere in the universe, even to places that aren't, connect, aren't created yet. And... Australia has the very unique ability to go into the uncreated, created part, where it can go deep into the dream time of parts of the universe that aren't created left, and it can seed ideas for our future selves to see even deeper into the future. It is no wonder that the, that the indigenous here have protected their knowledge for so long. Correct. Because they must know that. And, and, oh, yeah. The things that have been revealed the last, even the last year, about their level of knowledge, have been quite stunning, and it's not general knowledge yet, um, even around the alternative community, just how far that goes, and how how powerful a group of people they actually are. Um, and what you're putting here is again peeling back that next layer of information. And all I can say is, holy crap! Right. <laughs> As everybody's silently giggling over here. Yeah, I can, I can hear them. those holy crap wow moments a few times here. Uh, yeah. Followed up, by, followed up by, you can't make this shit up. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, it actually it actually feels, you know, this information has a feeling to it. And, uh, you know, if, if, if it resonates, it really does resonate. And what you're what you're describing, you, would it be a situation where the um, the continent would physically disappear off the planet, or is that or what you're describing really happening etherically? It can do all of the above. It all depends on the type of mission that the continent is going. If it's going to a let's say a world that is near death, because Earth can adopt a, a species of another world temporarily or permanently. And it can send a, a part of itself, which would be Australia, to go and be the rapid response emergency rescue system to a world that's in dire straits of destruction. And it can act as the emergency system to 
mass create refuge systems that can land in Australia and then be instantly teleported out while the, the actual continent of Australia isn't being affected by the destruction of that world, or it can physically meld itself with the world while still being here on Earth, much like I've said about certain mountains in our world that can be multi multi-dimensionally exist on thousands of worlds at once and create a, a permanent or temporary portal between the two worlds, mm -hmm. or it can physically leave Earth and have only water and replacement to it and then turn into an energy vehicle and go to any part of the universe as part of a massiveness consciousness exploration vehicle that has ambassadors from tens of thousands of other worlds who are willing to put themselves into this consciousness exploration vehicle to resolve some great issues because it's a massive ambassadorial remedy complex in, in multidimensional dream worlds. Um, I, mean, I don't know how else to describe it. It has many, many purposes. Um, and it is also a tool of war, too. I mean, when, Earth, Earth, when was the last time it left? Um, about 1706, 1705, that's when the last opportunity of the elders there uh, were able to do their special dream time dance in which they were able to eliminate some of the control room aspects and send off the main control room features into the dream time so the conquering forces of, of the British Empire weren't able to gain access to the actual control systems of the unity consciousness drive. So that action actually actually kept them from being completely dominated and complete the continent from being completely dominated. Correct. Um, before that before that the last time it physically left would have been about 31,000 BC, and it didn't really return to about 21, 22,000 BC. But ironically, because of the time wars, it was ripped out of its mission and put back into place numerous times. So 31,000, that's the roughest dates that I can tell you, but it did leave. Mm -hmm. And when it was forced back and then left and was forced back and all that other stuff that goes on with it, it's just a giant hairball. Would when the when the if the continent actually left, and the oceans flowed back in, would that not affect ocean levels around the planet? Correct, it would. It'd be like taking an ice cube out of a cup. But part of the control system of Earth would allow the planet to leave the, the continent to leave in such a way that it wouldn't cause massive disaster. Hmm. It would be something that would be equivalent to double the high tide. Yep, yeah. or double the low tide, as it were. Right. Yeah. Yeah, look, that's, wow. There's another movie script right there. In fact, several movies. <laughs> Amazing. TV series. <laughs> yeah, yep, whole TV series right there. Can't, as you said, you can't make this shit up. It's amazing. Hmm. It actually, uh, it actually ties in uh, well with the, with the general view of the indigenous in this country that they are protecting something. Oh yeah. Some, isn't, something isn't there like so, a, a famous monument or a famous rock and people talk about how that spiritual essence or something like that? I don't know what it's called, but it's a famous it uh, was, Yeah, it's, okay, it's called it's called rock or it, its real name is Uluru. And it's a sacred. Pl I mean, what I know of it is as a as a sacred place. It's a it's a it's a um, an energy vortex. It's 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 part of their dream time, and it's uh, you know no doubt involved in the process that Andrew's talking about at some point. It's right. a pretty obvious thing when you look at it, but it's it's a very large uh, rocky rock essentially. It's part of a part of a, um, a a mountain range that's or a rift that's at a very uh, oblique angle, and it's just poking out of the ground quite li literally. But it's connected very deep into the earth from where it is, and the land around it is incredibly flat, so it really stands out. And it's a deep dark red. It's a beautiful place. I actually went there as, uh, when I was about. Um, 12, 13, and at that time there was really no control on what the tourists could do, so I walked up it and around it and threw all some really beautiful um, you know, f um, f rock, uh, rock formations uh, in and around the base of it, and it's really, really uh, uh, an amazing place. 
from every respect. These days it's actually run by the community, the Aboriginal community, and uh, a lot of it is inaccessible, which is appropriate because it, it is one of their sacred places. In fact, um, um, don't know if they've necessarily done it. it. Walking up the rock is a real experience and it's way more limited than it used to be and I have a feeling that you actually can't even do it anymore but uh, don't quote me on that one because um, I'm not 100% sure. But even just to um, to observe it and walk around it is is a really interesting experience, and it it obviously is you know part of the the heritage and you know the uh, the secret of the Aboriginal community because they're far far better organised than I was taught at school. I've I've come to realise because they are actually inherently telepathic. Um, they were operating literally as as one community, um, you know. Always, and that has been lost to a fair degree by all the interference from the times that since white man has turned up to dominate the land. Right. But they still have it. It's still in place. They still have that. Well, there's a little bit more I want to talk about Australia, Chan, and Greenland. Those are the main places where the storehouse of the defensive weapons of Fortress Earth are destroyed. My I was telling you earlier that the etheric broadcasting satellite system is has a a way of pulling a pulling a large volume of other reserves out of the timelines. Well, Earth also has that built inside its interest system, and um, Australia, Greenland, and Japan are those places for those out of phase storehouses that can return defensive consciousness first strike weapons. Or, or counter first strike weapons to prevent reality busting concepts. Because essentially what we're doing inside this matrix right now is cracking the facade of the realities that are, are to make us give us belief structures. And there's five layers of facades. You have the patriot programming, you have your citizen programming, you have your spiritual programming, you have your monetary programming, and then you have the fundamental people that understand there's five facades. And for you to choose one is the choice of the system that's telling you. For you to say that I go to the original programming is to, is to engage your sovereign free will and understand that you need not to accept any of the facades. Of, of reality and you can get to the original rules of this reality separate of whatever cultures are living on it and they're known as consciousness defensive or first strike weaponry systems and that's what Australia, Japan and, and Greenland are about. Hmm. People can occupy those places and have psychically connected to those defensive or weaponry systems that exist there and can quite literally prevent timeline incursions. That's why Greenland is covered in ice. That's why Australia was dominated and controlled the way it was. And that's why Japan tried to hold out for as long as it could until finally the system cracked it and it was forced to be open. You know, and then all of a sudden the drugs and the greed flowed in. And what flew out of Japan was the technology of, of consciousness exploration. But it had already been sub subverted long ago. And the Japanese people really had no idea how much it was subverted before because the way the sacred feminine was so intricately, surgically dissected into the most basic essence of what it is so it had no power. And that's the most devious, subtle plan of all, of how that programming spread to the world. We have quite the mess to unpick. As you yep, go, the, and it's the, going to require people like Carlos to figure out what part of it they want to explain to others. I mean, Chris, you've been at you've been at this with me since May the nineteenth, since the first Walking and Energy show. Um, I've been doing this since uh, October last year, trying to explain the entire system from every angle that I could. Let me say something. I've, I've the seven wisdoms of the universe are already in archives. All right. The, uh, everything that we need to know to free our world is in just my adventures and reality shows. The walking and energy shows is me explaining the system. So for those of us out there that don't want to deal with religion or spirituality and want to get to the basic fundamental rules of our reality, here's what you need to know. And it'll be your free will discernment from your own heart space to determine how you want to challenge the reality with your belief system in flux. Hmm. 
challenging well, the reality, yeah. Andrew, um, is done. It, what Carlos is doing is challenging the reality, just putting that right. movie on. That's right. Challenging is local reality. So, Carlos, um, that was a big yes. Show the movie. <laughs> Cool. A long answer, a long answer to a short question. Just be careful with yeah. your own money, okay? Just be exactly. careful. You know, sell some free right. tickets. If you don't know what to do at a theater, do it at your local library on a, on a projection TV or something. Mm. Okay. Maybe you can get some local people to do to make it a volunteer. You know, so kids can get their volunteer time for graduating high school, and maybe have a little bake sale on a marching band or something like that. I mean, you just just be creative with it. Well, see, we had a, a chemtrail. Someone was wearing chemtrails, and she showed the what in the world are they spraying and the other one, I don't remember what it was. And so I kind of wanted to do the same thing, but hers was more of fear, 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 and I'm more of just wanting to want people to just start opening. Present, you know, present, and, present. Fear, fear and presentation, big difference. Hmm. Yeah, well, the, I'd, I'd probably say, Carlos, if you wanted to follow up, because really, think think a series of movies rather than just one. Um, you know, the, U, the UFO one, the, the Sirius is a good one. Thrive is a good one. It's fairly non-threatening. You want to move into the the uh, more strongly geopolitical, depending on, on people's views in your area, there's some really good 9-11 documentaries that are very startling. That, yeah. that could be worthwhile considering as well because that is something that everybody experienced personally and it's exactly. it's deeply embedded in the psyche. But do be careful with that because uh, it can, you, have, can, you can, you on you. can you suggest uh, a comprehensive one that's not too conspiratorial but enough? That well, one, know, one of the ones... Yeah, one of the ones I do still <clears throat> like because it actually... It deals, there's a lot of them that concentrate on specific aspects, like the engineering aspect is one of the buildings and, and how they couldn't perform that way. Um, and there's another one that concentrates on aspects of the TV broadcast and it reveals the fact that they did a lot of really quite shabby, simplistic things with the video material to make it look like there was multiple uh, coverage, multiple... Um, uh, TV stations covering with the broadcast, but all they were doing were were <clears throat> playing with backgrounds and and colours and just subtle things to make it look like there were different cameras in operation from different locations, and there really weren't. And there was a whole lot of other things they did too that were really quite crude from a special effects point of view. So the whole thing is actually uh, um, it does a it does a good job of dismantling what look like a very, to most people, a very organic and and comprehensively covered visual event on TV. It makes it look like what it was, which is just another bait and switch. It doesn't right. focus too much, too much on, on other aspects of it. It really just looks at the at the TV broadcast. And then from memory, that's called in plain sight, P-L-A-N-E, cool. plain sight. Right. So. I, think, I, think I, kinda, I think I saw that, but I don't know if I was ready because... Uh, well, I heard theories about, like, oh, there wasn't any planes at all. There were just bombs, and right when they, they computer-generated uh, airplanes, and then they blew off the bomb to make it look like the, the plane hit. So and, and I couldn't go there yet, I guess, because to me it was too much, but I was always open to, open to it and until I got more information out of it. So. Yeah, well, see, remember that experience, the, the experience you just described is not being quite ready for it. <clears throat> you're, you're actually describing people around you right now. Okay, exactly, but yeah. what, I'm, what I'm finding that in the last 18 months, people have become much more open to suggestion that things aren't as they appear. I have, so I have it's, seen that too, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's probably, you know, if you were putting this movie up five years ago, you'd probably have had a problem. But now, not so much. But, you know, the, the UFO was a good one because it's sort of that, you know, there's been a lot of science fiction soft disclosure, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, 
different kinds of movies, both kind of positive or fearful and non-fearful about extraterrestrial life, to the point where uh, once they, where they look at the serious documentary, they've got an anchor t with which to deal with that. And it's a little bit distant because the anchor is in science fiction. Okay? In, in the 9-11 movie, the anchor is in their personal experience of 9-11. So there's uh, a, it's a different situation. So the the UFO one, I think, is a good place to start. To be honest. Yeah. Well, I kind of felt that too, but um, I've heard some stuff about uh, Dr. Stephen Greer, and I was like, well, should I? Should I not? And it's like, I'm all about perspective, and you know, I always, you know, if I ever get in front of an audience, I'll say, this is just perspective. Just take what you want and go research, and you know, do your own research and and just just go with it and see what you find out for yourself, you know, because that's what I've been doing for almost 20 years. I um, I read David Icke's The Biggest Secret, and I haven't gone back, so. And that's that's the way it works. Um, okay, sorry, Andrew's, Andrew's just writing me a message here that I'm glad I just read. Uh, we actually have to take a music break here too, Carlos, but... Um, yeah, I'm sorry, thank you. No, that's no, that's fine, Larry. Uh, uh, Carlos, everything is perspective. It's a matter of uh, people mission to be in observer mode. Okay, just just saying. Right. Okay, here's some information. Take it in. Do what you want with it. <clears throat> and you can't do anything but tell them your response to it. And your response can be something like this. You know, I've been. I've been um, reading things outside the mainstream media for a long time. Hard to tell exactly, exactly where the where the truth lies in all of it. But I'm getting enough confidence in aspects of 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 it that I'm, I'm finding the main truth is that things are not as they appear, and that we really need to take another look at everything around us to work out what's really going on. Yeah. Exactly. So you're not you're not actually so I'm not I'm, you can't get up and say I'm presenting you the truth. No, 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 that's not an accurate statement. Right. But you do have to give them confidence that that it's information which will reveal some truth to them that they won't have experienced before. Just because you, you don't want to crack the paradigm wide open, you just want to lever it open a little bit so they'll open it the rest of themselves. That's exactly. the trick. Yeah. yeah. So Carlos, we'll we'll jump off and take a music break. And okay, thank, thank you for you. your thank you for your question, and we'll talk to you again. Okay. Okay, Andrew, we're going to take that take that music break, and I'll play the nice quiet one because I think after that information we need to relax for a minute. Yeah, and okay. what I'm going to do is go to mobile, and then Larry here is going to step in, and I'm going to go to the edge of Hanalei, the Hanalei Resort here, and draw on some of the energy to add to the next part of the presentation. This first part of the show has been outstanding, and I'd like to be able to take some more calls. Um, people, you know, when you start bringing your, your energy into this, have a deeper understanding of, of why this show is like this, why walking energy till now, you know, both Chris and I have been working so hard, and that's because you are going to be the next layer of presenters here, all yeah. of you. Yeah. That's true. That is exactly what's happening. Exactly what's happening. Okay, um, I'll I'll uh, call I'll call you on the phone and add you in. Uh, do you want to do that straight away, or do you want to do that in a few minutes? Yes, time? So like that, and we'll leave the Skype active and Larry and and we're back again. And for some reason or other, my Skype on the other machine just started ringing. I'm going to ignore that. We have Andrew on the mobile and Larry Bazell on. Uh, Andrew's original Skype contact. How are you, Larry? I'm doing really excellent this morning. Good. Now, you might remember Larry from last week. We had an extensive discussion with he and another member of his family, Katie, about how that all works for them. And uh, I presume you're all having a good time in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. You've got that right. I'm going to go swim with the turtles this afternoon. As soon as we're done with the show, we're going to have a talk with them about this. Mm. A little chat with the turtles. A little chat with the turtles. As a, as, a, as a professional fisherman, you were actually telling me a while back, you actually um, communicate with the consciousness of schools of fish and invite them to experience your net and what follows. <laughs> so there's a lot of anchors. I'm, I'm usually surprised that 
I guess it's really interesting for a fish to go for a ride and to uh, lay in the snow and go for a ride in a truck. You know, they really don't they don't get that chance quite all the time. Mm. It's a it's it, that, that that's a Dr. Seuss experience actually. Yes, the way you describe it. But uh, I presume the conversation with the turtles will be quite will, will be quite different. So the interesting thing about that with the fish, you know, I uh, I, I put, brought my net off of the boat. It had a really big hole in it that needed to be sewn up, and all the holes got sewn up. And so I put it back on the boat. And I was thinking about, geez, no hole for the guys to get out that want to go. But it wasn't even a minute later. I I snagged the net on the rocks, <laughs> and it fixed itself. <laughs> Put yeah. plenty of holes in there for them. So I don't even know why I bothered sewing it. <laughs> that's the exit hole for the guys that aren't quite sure about the ride in the truck. Yeah, the, that's the two pills, I guess. They don't want to go for a ride in a the truck. They want to hang out, stay there, so they're welcome to stay. Yep. Well, it's 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 actually quite a lovely story, that, in a way. I mean, you're still catching fish, essentially, but there's an eye for you. And yeah, well, at least they're with an, in agreement. Yes, yes, it's it's actually um, it's actually a positive agreement for both sides. It's a win-win, if you like. Hmm. So, Andrew, uh, you're on the edge of the resort now. Yes, I'm on the edge of the resort at the Hanalei Bay Resort in Kauai. We're looking big down drop area into a luscious rainforest. Hmm. Very nice. And what's the weather like there, just so we can set? Um, sunny, 80 degrees with a little bit of wind, 85 degrees with a little bit of wind. Hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful rainforest type scenario. Excellent. And do you like the energies at that particular spot, do you? Oh, yeah, it's amazing energies. All, all throughout this, this whole island, the island has special spots all over it. Now, when I first landed here, literally I felt, the Constitution of the United States doesn't have the full expression over the energy of people here. Uh-huh. You still got the sovereign um, aspect. Patriot, the Patriot programming is far less here. It is as if the mountains itself act as the opening field for the domination and control system. Fascinating. When you start to describe local realities in, in the, you know, with the, uh, the language that you've developed around around the galactic history material, it really does highlight why we feel different when we travel. For instance, in this right. particular instance, we get countries with completely different feel, and I've always actually wondered about that why it should be so. And you know, I'm sort of I'm having that question answered, but the the answer itself raises so many other questions, which you've been aggressively providing information on. And and it just it just just brings into focus what it is we're actually living in. But you know, it allows we're, living in a we're living in a disunity reality that's linked together through technology, both etheric and physical technology, that keeps us in a system of materialism, consumerism, run by domination and control. That's it, folks. <laughs> that was the statement. That's what we're living in what you're living in, and, and, disunity, paradox, reality, and the remedy is domination and control. Yeah, and that description... Keep us, at the lowest com to lead, keep us at the lowest common denominator of our soul. Use your free will or get stuck. That that explanation I was giving before of how, how I describe the system to people, how, the, how it's you know a giant corporate machine that works by division, it's it's actually the same thing. It's just restated at all surface level. It's the, mm -hmm. exactly the same statement. So, Andrew, you, you wanted to bring in those energies into this part of the show? Yep, I did. Okay. Do we? Do you want uh, for uh, Helene and, and Nikki to pop in now, or do you want to do that at the end? Well, we can have them pop in now if they're, if they're ready to talk. I mean, it's we had an incredible first hour of the show, and I want to thank Carlos for bringing in his energy and to showing that you know you can do something, even if it's at your local level, of saying. I'm going to put on a movie and invite people to come and see it, a movie that's already been in presentation and has been experienced by thousands of others. And not, a, not only that, positive emotion. Yeah, not only that, Carlos came and he asked one question and we talked for 40 minutes or more. 
Yep. And the, the amount of ground we covered in that 40 minutes as a result of that one question was extraordinary. So, so you know, just Carlos, I hope, is still listening. And just to understand how this process actually works, that as soon as your energy is introduced into a situation, a whole new level of information actually came out, stuff that we hadn't actually heard before that's actually really important, you know, particularly for, for me down here. You know, something to learn about, you know, more la more of the layers of the of the reality down here than have ever been revealed for, before. Because those statements that Andrew made about here have never been made before. That's yeah. completely. I only new. talked about the consciousness drive in Kia one time, and that was because a specific person had called in, and they function as one degree of separation, and that one degree of separation allows me to open up the information stream to the whole collective. Because this is about informing the collective that the reality is greater than the belief system that, that the collective is based on. Interesting. Okay. Well, let's pull in Nikki and Helene. They're still in the room. Hello, Nikki and Helene. Hi, Chris. Aloha, Chris. Aloha to you, too. How has the experience been so far? <laughs> Wonderful. I hope to get a lot of iron, island fever. I already have island fever. <laughs> I'm having the best time. I think this is a good fever. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. This is this is the fever that leads you to not want to go home. Oh, I don't want to. Well, I I am just a minute in the moment. Mm -hmm. I'm enjoying my time here, and uh, I had the best time on the beach. I've already gotten up early and swam. Mm. It's. It's amazing, and the energy just is so, I don't know, I, I feel like it's, uh, the veil is so thin here, I could really take a close look at myself, what I'm doing, you know, what my purpose is, it's been a gift to be here for me, and a gift uh, to be with the people that I'm here with, so it's been a ball. Mm. Yeah, well, it would be uh, a wonderful thing to be able to sit down and spend social time with a group like the one you're with. So hoping to experience a bit of that at the conference coming up, and I presume that was one of the things you wanted to speak of while while you're on the conference that's coming up in October. That's so great. Chris, you're coming to Florida? I hope so, yeah. That's the plan. Oh, I'm so excited. Yes, Return to Atlantis is less than two months away. It's October 4th through the 6th in Lido Key, Florida, um, and I actually brought a bag of sand, 99% quartz crystal sand that never gets hot, and um, I actually brought it with us to Kauai. Actually, Larry is is here with it right now, brought it over to the phone. And we also have amazing speakers, Andrew and Wanda. We have Laura Magdalene Eisenhower and Dr. Dream and Lisa Renee. This is her first um, appearance in three years, so um, she found it. She 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 saw the importance of everybody coming together. Um, I think I think ley lines are changing. I think soul families will be coming together, and I'm so happy you're coming, Chris. It's it's time for me to to actually do a bit of traveling. I think. I had a traveling okay. experience a couple of, uh, well, the weekend before last, you know, road trip weekend with some amazing people and uh, followed by the road trip home, which is never as good as the road trip out, but, you know, that's the way it is. But just the experience of getting away from my little own local reality bubble here was excellent. And, you know, it was refreshing to go to a new location, particularly the one I went to, which was gorgeous. It was a, a lake by the sea. And uh, uh, a property that quite a property that was quite heavily wooded, beautiful natural setting. Spent some time out on the lake, spent some time on the land, and uh, it was really, really great. In fact, it always strikes me as how much water is involved in in every aspect of our lives, particularly the recreation. There you are sitting on an island talking about a beach and another spot on the planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm looking back on, you know, some time by the water that I spent a couple of weeks back. So, and water being a crystal, a liquid crystal, and you holding a bag full of crystal sand, uh, I think it speaks volumes about what's actually going on there. Because it's, it's all a, it's all a, it's all a consciousness journey. It's 
it's interesting. This is Return to Atlantis. First of all, I, I didn't even mention that Tom Lesher and Teal Scott are two of our other guests when I was going off on, you know, and uh, I just went a little off uh, uh, off the subject. But, um, you know, here we are in ancient Lemuria, the lands of ancient Lemuria, and, and the conference is all about Atlantis, and it's very interesting. It'd be like a little bit, I guess I've been thinking about healing the past to start anew, like two ancient civilizations right at the forefront. Yeah, well, Andrew's information about Atlantis and Lemuria is, is clarifying what actually happened in that period of Earth's history. And yeah, there, there really is some healing that needs to be done over, over that whole segment of our history. You feel, think, a, you feel a particular attachment to Atlantis yourself personally, do you? I feel a particular attachment to Lemuria, but the geographic area where I actually live is very close to the remains of Atlantis. And um, my friend Greg Prescott, who I'm putting this together with, um, had a very, very strong attachment to Atlantis. We started, as we, were, as we were putting this together, we said, okay, we'll start with Atlantis, and uh, maybe someday we'll do Return to Lemuria conference. Yeah. So first things first, we're starting with Atlantis, and, you know, and then uh, I, I had this thought when I brought this sand um, here to sprinkle it here in ancient Lemuria or the lands of ancient Lemuria and almost bring it together in a physical sense. I wonder, um, I don't know, Nikki, what do you think? Do you think that that could have a, a, a real impact? On changing? Oh, yes, definitely. There'll be a definitely energy connection circuit in that aspect. And uh, so we are definitely looking for um, performing ceremonies we are also using brought huge, gigantic Tinado cones with us. <laughs> Mary has brought his 26-inch uh, cone, and I brought my 16-inch cone and plus two other inch cones and a little uh, Tinano disc. And uh, I've also built new technologies to help people on the mass scale of um, uh, deconstructing their body matrix and um, reprogrammed to their original form and so I'm looking forward to finishing building that technology for uh, healing uh, people on the mass uh, scale and uh, being here um, is been an honor to uh, have these wonderful experiences with amazing people here Katie Larry um, Helena and also Andrew and um, you know, we have differences in cooking Things in the kitchen. Uh -huh. but let me tell you, there's a lot of head chefs here. Uh -huh. <laughs> They'll eventually for it's position been, at the stove, is it? Yeah, but it's been wonderful experiences. <laughs> I just imagine you have a lot of the head, you know, French head chef in the kitchen, you know, all the time. Yeah. So, and uh, I've uh, been, uh, you know, doing my own healing training uh, as well and uh, building like, new technology. And, um, yeah, it, it takes a lot of discipline to uh, be the level that you're at and you always have to take care of your body. And this goes for all the light workers out there as well. Big and, message. Big message there. Yes, thank you. So uh, we, we are waiting um, for the upcoming event. Uh, in November, the, you already, for some of you who are extra sensitive, will start feeling the um, the energy. Okay, it's gonna build up towards uh, the end of uh, towards uh, Thanksgiving, and then uh, December month. There's gonna be huge stuff going on, and this is funny. I've seen this coming um, before. And uh, so I'm, I'm definitely in training for those of you who are doing energy work. Start taking care of your body is priority on mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical level to get ready for this. And some of uh, people that are already doing some, uh, taking some of my sessions, 
they they are they are preparing themselves at some level, so many levels that they can't even comprehend. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but I'm leaving that as option. You know, this is a volunteer. This is not a force or of anything. Anybody who volunteer is always a welcome. But there are things that one must have to uh, follow, and that is doing extensive amount of self healing, clearing, and also uh, ancestral uh, karma healing is priority. Mm. It sounds like there's going to be uh, a specific exercise that you're carrying out in that time. Mm-hmm. Is that where you're headed with this? Definitely. Okay. Do you want to talk about that now, or we'll leave that for a future show? Uh, we'll leave it till the future show. But this is uh, this is just a quick glimpse of what is coming for, uh, especially for all those uh, who are listening. I mean, it's, no, it's not always good. Uh, in terms of security wise, okay, protect the listeners and protect us. Um, so we don't want to reveal everything. Sure. We reveal everything. So just those rooms are a little bit of pieces. Cookie crumbs. Cookie crumbs, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, just yeah, just set up the situation. No, that's fine. That is fine. And also on on the subject of the Shinano technology, um, I'm going to be acquiring a, a disk and a pendant fairly shortly, and uh, Nikki is going to explain the the usage and aspects of them on air over over the next couple of shows. And de- a little bit further yeah. down the track, we'll do the same thing with the cones, which take a little bit right. more work to set up. Right, and I'm to hoping to put on a teleseminar with an H video if we have that option and Larry is noting his as yet. Mm-hmm. and I like for our listeners to be able to tap into that and uh, get a lesson direct lesson okay so that I will teach you how to use it for different things so what it means is that you're not just I'm just it's not a one way it would be a two ways where I will literally scan each one of you and tell you where and how your energy feel runs and then and how you uh, apply the T9 technology. For those of you who are planning on doing that, uh, I highly recommend that you get the product first before you sign up. And this should be coming soon, very soon, because I need to prepare people to uh, do self-healing protection in order to use the technology to help them amplify and do the work on a higher level. It, it's that easy button. Mm. We don't want to over. <laughs> yeah, this is the this is the Nikki Fetzi fast button. Yes. Bang! Do it now. No, that's that's great. That'll be a very interesting exercise the for easy. everybody. <laughs> it also gets people back onto the wheel of divinity. So for example, the most important thing. Sorry, Angie. Yeah. You want to re- you want to repeat yeah. that? It was a little bit choppy. It gets people back onto the wheel of divinity. We as humans incarnated in this world are meant to be divinity beings. And many of us lose divinity because of the reincarnation cycle. And the technology that Nikki is presenting helps you get back onto the wheel of divinity instead of on the infinite loop of reincarnation. So it's such a connecting technology. Healing, connecting, and allows the I am self to be present on many layers of, of, of level, levels of awareness. Mm. Well, the um, sovereignmedia.net is where that webinar will be run from, I presume. Uh, Larry, could you confirm that? Oh well, yeah, we'll we'll put we'll put everything that needs to be done there. And the other the other um, webinar, no sorry, sorry, Larry. Yeah, the other webinar Nick, Nikki and I have talked about is actually uh, about um, dealing with uh, children and the issues oh, yeah, that, that issues that face children throughout this period of time as well. Yes. Yes, they are the future of our um, of humanity. So we have to guide them in the right direction, and we will require parents who already signed a contract to have them come through in this lifetime to take their full responsibility and help them assist as much as they can. Excellent. Well, Andrew, would you like to press on with some more questions? Uh, if Nikki and Helene, uh, do you have any more things you want to talk about today, specifically? I just, I just want to say one thing. I, I was listening to Nikki talking about her technologies, and last night, Chris, mm-hmm. oh my goodness, I had the healing of the century. Basically, every, every single thing that was brought here was used on me. A gigantic cone, these discs, 
What else? What else? Did you know, disc. I had a disc. I mean, they're all over my body. And then Katie was doing the healing, and Andrew was assisting in the background, and Larry was was close by. Um, it was intense. When I put one of the discs on my third eye, all of a sudden, like, flashed into my head as, like, a being, like, uh, just just what the earth looked like. I was actually looking down the earth, like, right before I was about to be born. My third eye was cleared right open. Now, it could be, Katie did an amazing job on me last night. And, of course, all these cones, I mean, I, I was laying down, so I didn't see exactly where they were. I know Andrew said to put under my armpits, and they, they were all over me. It was intense, and then Larry had a healing like that back-to-back. -back. We were, like, just laying there and, and having this, and we were trying to talk this morning about what we saw. Um, I would highly recommend. I can't believe how powerful. When I was introduced to the technologies, they were telling me, just hold it in your hand and see if you can feel it. And right away, pretty pretty soon after, I could feel my whole hand tingling and a warm, like, just piercing right through. I mean, I can only imagine... Well, that was a cone. That was just a small cone. That wasn't even a six-inch cone. Yeah, that was just a teeny little cone that did it. I mean, so you didn't have the twenty-six-inch. I had the twenty-six-inch cone between my legs. I mean, that was so. It was so nice for me. <laughs> okay, we just took a lift here, folks. <laughs> Far out. Right. I had separate luggage for that. <laughs> 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 they won't check you manually at the uh, security. Yeah, the <laughs> apparently, so my apparently. is uh, it's a Christmas cone. Okay? So for those of you who are planning on traveling with a cone, <laughs> okay, instead of checking in, just say that it's a Christmas cone. It always works. I was wondering. Hey, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Katie uh, dubbed that type of healing yesterday the chi oven. The chi oven. oven, yeah. That's what yeah. it would be like. Yeah. And part, oh, of her part, of, part of Helene's experience is recovering her full sovereignty, recovering her life because she's overworked just like everyone else here. And when you become overworked, you, you get away at your, your base energies of your organs. And her third eye opening just showed her how in connection with the chi field you can be when you properly set up a healing space with the cones, with the discs, and the true heartfelt intention of healing, holding space. Um, Larry was right next to her holding the male space, uh, Katie running the sacred feminine space, and helping the energies move to the places that the body needed to recharge and regenerate and recycle the old energies into new and I was operating on the etheric level, making sure that the area was protected, as well as bringing in the other ancestors that Helene had so she can do her own higher level soul retrieval at a pace that was acceptable to her vacation, her working vacation, and her experiences of the life that she's been looking for for the last six weeks. You know, after the healing, we all went out and uh, went up to the, the power spot and we're having a, a cigarette, and we're talking to Helene about her vision for spaces and healing spaces, and we got to some of her core issues of, of who she was when she grew up, you know, and, you know, and wanted to become a, a, a person that the psychic can give advice to the fact that she grew into a world just like me without anyone to teach her, and the same with Nikki. There was no one to teach her. You know, she grew up from the refugee camps of Laos to all of a sudden being here in the United States and had to do it herself. Helene, the same, grew up in New York City, wanted to become, you know, something, and yet couldn't be fully accepted by all parts of her family growing up in much and similar to my life. And Helene, you know, has had a book in her mind for some time, and I think she had a lot more clear experience with all that extra wonderful energy of herself invested and involved to that creation process. So will Helene be having a series of healings throughout, this, throughout the uh, time there in Hawaii? Oh, yes. Every, everyone up here will be. Mm. So, Helene, how are you feeling today after that intense intense time in the chi oven last night? I feel really good. It was like I was not that hot. I guess I was like I felt my hands and feet were really hot, but, but um, the room temperature 
was extremely hot, like an oven. <laughs> it literally was. I found later. Um, I feel really good. I got up and swam. You know, it was interesting too. I had to. I was in a great state of mind, uh, really, to get that. I was really pretty happy all day. I I had been in the ocean. I was looking at the reefs. I was looking at beautiful fish and and swimming most of the day. So I was pretty cheerful and in the space ready to receive that. Um, but then uh, I started uh, different things that after I was so happy started almost coming out of my back. And I, I said to Katie, I was like, Katie, you got to help me. Um, I don't know how to get make this pain go away. I don't even know where it's coming from. Where's all the pain inside of me? coming from and why is it coming out right now because I think I had such a beautiful day it doesn't make any sense so um, yeah it was it was intense it was intense uh, and uh, I okay, slept like a man. That, that, is the metaphorical that, monkey. that is the metaphorical monkey on your back getting taken off huh huh we all carry a monkey I, in our back that, that monkey is the weight of our life we have unresolved. And the remedy was for you to ask for help from people that you trusted. And in that zone of trust, in that circus sacred space that we created, you allowed yourself to say, I don't need this anymore. And allowed it to be replaced with yes. fresh energy. Fresh, Please. new, wonderful energies of inspiration and hope. Creativity. Your dream to come to life. Your dream to come to life spread to Larry. Larry spread it to me and Katie. I spread it to Nikki. And and you know the goal was to get Chris to come here. But at the same time, Chris had things aligning in his world that brought him to a place in Australia. And now it's being realigned to everyone to return to Atlantis. Beautiful. <laughs> I'm so excited to meet you. That's gonna be it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna It'll, be amazing. Oh look, I had an amazing time. The the people the group of people at Lake Conjola were all people who who have been following the shows along for a long time. And uh and I and I saw them because I've I'd spoken to them on Skype, but I had complete strangers giving me bear hugs. You know, it was <laughs> a fantastic thing and I all uh, I know some of them are listening to these shows and thank you guys for a really amazing and very rewarding weekend at every level. It was really, really fun and a great experience. And it was really great to, to experience the energy of these folks in person. That's that's the most exciting thing. You can experience stuff a little bit uh, through Skype and, and whatever means of, means of communication, but in the same space, occupying the same space to people who are so open and... <laughs> In that moment, uh, that is that is quite different. I can completely understand how how um, meshing being with soul family would be. So, yeah, long long answer, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it too, Helene. Yeah, be great. You're definitely, you're definitely <laughs> going to be feeling the love. You're gonna, you know, and you're gonna like Greg Prescott a lot too. I just know, too. I already know uh, that. I already know that no, he's he's a, he's a great guy and, and uh, it was yeah. so nice. How NFD and sovereign media kind of came together. Well, and, look, there's uh, there's an amazing amazing coalescence amongst the presenters across the mainstream media at the moment, and, it, and it's really I actually wanted this to happen months ago, and it's actually happening now, where where people are really joining forces because this is the moment where we all we are regrouping at the moment to push this information further out. That's what's actually going on. The conference that you're having is part of it. Uh, there are shows and, and, and uh, hosts joining a lot of like that brainstorming session we had last week. And we're moving up to a high level and it's kicking up a gear for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, Andrew, presenters, are polishing, the presenters are polishing the information to be shared in a massive multi-dimensional brainstorming event that will help other people that are about to be presenters understand that the big picture is so big that it must be broken down into individual parts so individual presenters can perceive this big picture on their own. Yes. And the irony of this show is Carlos. 
his one sentence, 40, his one statement about presenting a movie to his local population because he understood he has to affect his local reality. You know, the presenters like me and Nikki and Helene and Larry and Teal and all the others that are coming to the event, we're presenting to a, a big reality. But it's the individual realities that come to the message and decipher that message for their local reality and that they share with their local friends and family, whether they're soul family or not. Even if you're born into a family that's not soul family, they're still family. They're still going to resolve something or find remedy or find some type of hope and inspiration that helps the whole collective reverse engineer the disunity paradox remedy that we're in on an individual basis. So the individuals can see them their sovereignty, free will, and declare, I do not consent to domination and control. I reconfirm my consent to the Earth Mother's divine communion of creation and creation appropriation I've I've I am extremely uh, honored to actually be part of this process and uh, it's it's just an extraordinary thing to be a part of I must say it's actually because this has to happen this this final step where, the the every 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 individual on this planet has an opportunity to re-engage their free will, and the amount of passion and energy that's going to release as a result is going to be extraordinary. I don't think individual we, mental birthing. Yeah, it's going to be the most incredible event. Well, I don't know. It's certainly ever on this planet. Ever is ever in the universe. Overstating it, Andrew, because the number of races that are out there whose futures depend on on what happens next on this planet, I, I think it's not understating it to say it's going to be the most amazing event ever in this universe. Am I am I overstating that? No, you're you're actually understating. It. It's going to be a cross universal event. As I've talked about the migration patterns of souls from other universes, there are other universes that are at the state where their their system is literally being halted by what's happening on the micro levels on Earth. And there are other universal prime creators that are speaking to our prime creator of this universe to find remedy and resolve. And if it's not done, they, all the universes will step in and find remedy and resolve without our consent and free will. That's where it's come to. We have to stand up to this period of, of 2011 to 2014 to indicate to all the other universes we do have a remedy and the resolve is us standing in our free will. And those that won't stand in their free will will be given their pink slip and told to get out of the goddamn universe. <laughs> Period. <laughs> or, or you'll get blasted. <laughs> yeah, look, look the, the, I keep coming back to this. Every time I talk through this with, with people around me, I come back to this one thing. <clears throat> when we do this, on the other side of it, we'll look back and say, that was incredibly simple. What took us so long? The and that's when they will discover that there are very powerful high energy beings who were given the choice of their own free will to intercede with their free will and should not to intercede because of dogmas and political beliefs that they created on the micro level and ultimately filtered up to their macro level. Helene, did you want to jump in? It's their creation. I just I love I love hearing Andrew when he's talking also about um, some of the other implications of uh, putting this event together. It was last October, you know. I I didn't really even know Greg Prescott, and um, I just knew we were going to be working together. And and uh, I actually I, just, I contacted him and I'm like, let's do this. I didn't even know him. I didn't even know him. And he was like, you know, I always had a feeling that I was going to be doing this. And um, I'm very connected to my Atlantean lives, and I can't believe this. And so um, we, we decided to do this, and, um, I, and, uh, and then I also I got on his radio. I, I got a show on his uh, network also then, too. And then we just started planning this, and we've been planning this now for about a year. Um, we were really creating it. We anticipated that 
the ley lines would change in doing this. And you know, this is a, uh, this spot that this conference is taking place. This is probably one of the most attacked places on the earth. I mean, and um, also very close to the BP oil spill. And so, in having this is a this is a major healing uh, that is going to be taking place in this area. Later on, when I met Andrew and um, asked him to be a speaker at our event, he had shared with me that this would be an opportunity for soul families to come together. And so that even you know so that was even more it added even more intensity to this. We only anticipated that. This would bring together uh, those from Atlantean or that had Atlantean um, past lives or past life experiences. It's much bigger and much deeper than that. So, uh, you know, for folks that are interested, we still have a couple of tickets left. It uh, You can find us at in5devents.com. And for those who can't uh, get to Lido Key, Florida, um, they can tune in on live stream. Excellent. Excellent. I'm so happy you're coming, Chris. That's so great. Uh, that will be fun. Will be fun. I'm declaring it. I'm declaring, declaring a holiday for myself. <laughs> <laughs> I should mention there's a um, there's a fundraising and. Uh, event tomorrow with Teal Scott. I think you talked to her this morning and, and Blake, uh, the follow-up call to the one we did earlier uh, at that SovereignMedia.net. We'll have it tomorrow at 6 Mountain Standard Time, I think. But I'm having a really hard it's, time with it's the time. Gonna be, it's going to be at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 2 p.m. Hawaiian Time. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to be... It's at noon. <laughs> uh, Australian Time, it's at noon. <laughs> I'll just throw that, that in for anyone who wants to attend. And this is and this is a benefit for the Return to Atlantis conference. You know, this is what's different also when we realized that soul families were coming together. We're throwing a catered party on the beach with music and dancing and celebration. We even have Earth Origins, which is, oh, an amazing organic food place. Um, they're catering the event. And we're growing this for our our speakers and for all of our guests. Um, and this is just a chance for people to celebrate coming together. So in putting this together, um, that that money uh, comes out of whatever whatever the tickets are. And so we're we're making a benefit for that and to help fly all of our speakers um, to the event too. And so that would be where that money would be going for and the webinar that's um, tomorrow, August 28th at 8 p.m. Eastern with Tio and Andrew. And I'm going to be hosting. Excellent. Now, Andrew, we have only a few minutes to go. We've, uh, this uh, uh, last hour has vanished right before our eyes. Is there anything you wanted to cover off on, on this last couple of minutes? Um, I've pretty much said everything that I need to say for this first two hours, but I will make one last statement to all those beings that are receiving their pink slips right now. The time is done. Accept your fate. Move on. The world is now ours, and the harder you hold on, the deeper your erasure will go. This is Lookout Mountain signing off. Wow. I guess it's back to us. That was a deep statement from Andrew just there. That sounded like a pink, pink slip warning to me. Larry, are you still with us? Oh, yes. I was just trying to wake Katie up so she can go go talk to the turtles. Yeah, we're going, yeah. We're going to uh, see the sea turtles going to the uh, uh, today. With our friend Curtis. Excellent, excellent. Look, yeah. well, well, we'll end the show here. Um, Andrew's signed out because he's walking back to your um, accommodation there from the edge of the resort. Uh, you guys are heading out to swim with the turtles. 
I can hear my dog stirring in the background. It's been a fantastic two hours, guys. Really enjoyed it. And we'll be talking to you in a couple of days' time. Absolutely. Right. Namaste, Chris. Namaste to you and namaste to everybody in the chat room and listening to this live, etc. We'll see you in, in uh, two days' time, but don't forget the webinar tomorrow. If you have uh, the desire to join us, that will be absolutely tremendous. So that's it for the Galactic History Show for today. We'll wish you a great day. And we'll just play out a little bit of music to finish and see you again.